Uh, I'm Brian Hosmer, and I also want to make sure that, that we um, recognize all the people who made this possible, right? We have Gilcrease staff and HCAR staff, and uh, our Dean Kalpana Misra is here who's supported this enterprise and Culture of the Americas all the way through, so my gratitude for you taking some time out of your, your very, very busy schedule. So, a couple of things here uh, before we move into it. One thing in, in particular, uh, we have surveys audience surveys that are over here and we would really like it if you would if you haven't so far to take a moment and fill it out we always want to know this thing we always want to collect your opinions but even more so in this case because we've really kind of flipped the script a little bit in the way that we've organized this conference rather than a you know specific theme oriented around one corner of the collections we flipped it around and we asked faculty members uh, at TU to craft panels and take ownership of panels that intersected with this concept of dislocations and migrations, but in all sorts of ways. So we want to know what you think about that, right? We organized this differently. We thought about it differently. Uh, and so please, if you will, take, take a moment to do that. All right, so we're going to move to panel uh, seven right now, which is Caribbean migrations and dislocations, comparative perspectives on Gene Rees. But before we do, we also have yet another one of our short video segments where our wonderful archivists and librarians talk to all of us about the collections that we have here at TU that relate to this panel. So it's about two minutes, and then we'll... My name is Mark Carlson and I'm the Librarian of Special Collections and University Archives at McFarland Library, the University of Tulsa. I am here to speak to you about the author Jean Rees, particularly as she relates to Caribbean migration. Jean Rees was born in 1890 in Dominica in the Caribbean and lived there until she was 16 when her family forced her to move to England. After she moved to England, she eventually started writing. Her best known work, The Wide Sargasso Sea, is after a fashion a prequel to um, Jane Eyre. Jean chose to tell the story of Antoinette as she envisioned uh, that character. Antoinette had been born a slave in the Caribbean and after she was freed in 1834 because the British ended the slave trade in Britain and Britain co British colonies, um, she was eventually was forced to go to England where she married an unnamed English gentleman. And and it goes through her life of her living with him, being separated from her family, and being gradually driven insane. We have the complete papers of Jean Reese, and all of her materials are available at McFarland Library. Now what do I do? What do I do now? Okay. Okay. <laughs> famous last words of a conference organizer, right, is, what do I do now, right? <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, Caribbean Migrations and Dislocations, Comparative Perspectives on Jean Rees, organized by Danielle Carlotti-Smith, PhD, who is a public research fellow at the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities, an adjunct professor in Global Scholars Program here at the University of Tulsa. Her presentation is entitled Trajectories of Dislocation, Genealogy, Trauma, and Circular Migration in Jean Rees' Wide Sargasso Sea and Maurice Condé's Desiderata. So, Dr. Carlotti Smith is suffering from a severe cold that has cost her voice. So, you're, what are you going to do? You're just going to soldier on and then see how far it goes? Soldier on. Oh, my gosh. We appreciate that. But, you know, uh, if you need to, right? Do you need somebody running this or? I will use it afterwards. Okay. So I'm going to try to power through this. <laughs> and I also recently discovered that I have the stomach flu. So I will do my best. I apologize for my croaky voice. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, and I don't need slides. 
So I actually um, <clears throat> prepared just a couple you know, introductory remarks about our panel before I start speaking about my topic. Can you understand me or am I super squeaky? Okay. <clears throat> so first of all, I'm delighted to be chairing this panel right, on Caribbean migrations and dislocations, comparative perspectives on Jean Rees, which allows me to engage with the work of two Caribbean scholars whose work I admire, one a specialist of Francophone Caribbean literature, the other as specializing in the literature of the Anglophone Caribbean. The three of us come from very different cultural backgrounds, specifically Brazil, Martinique, and South Korea, but we are all drawn to the rich and complex literary and cultural history of the Caribbean region. As everyone who is attending the symposium knows, migration is a phenomenon that has always occurred among peoples. In the, wor um, in the words of the investigative journalist and author Patrick Kingsley, quote, the story of humanity is essentially the story of human movement. End quote. And perhaps the region that most exemplifies the movement and encounter of different peoples is the Caribbean. The dynamics of migration, forced and voluntary, and creolization have played a central role in creating unique and ever-evolving linguistic, cultural, and literary environments throughout the region, alternately referred to as the extended Caribbean by critics such as Peter Hume, and Plantation America by Caribbean cultural theorists such as Rex Nettleford and Edouard Glissant. And more broadly, it's also been referred to as the Atlantic world. So what Brian Hosmer just said about our sort of hemispheric understanding um, also applies to our papers about the Caribbean. So I can skip over my uh, introduction of Jean Rees, thanks to the video. Um, so our panel examines the interrelated concepts of migration, dislocation, and displacement in the work of Rees. Our papers will discuss the expression of a gendered poetics of belonging and displacement in wide Sargasso Sea, the ways in which identity and the search for home are inscribed <coughs> on the female body in Reese's unfinished autobiography, Smile Please, and the impact of genealogy and trauma on migration in Wide Sargasso Sea and the Guadeloupian writer um, so from the French Caribbean island of Guadeloupe, Marie Scondé's novel, Desirata. <clears throat> um, and sort of as a prequel to my own presentation, I wanted to, you know, kind of in the spirit of Holy Week, uh, talk, begin my talk by doing a little evangelizing, but not of a religious sort, more of a literary sort, to talk about the importance of literature and the role it can play in our understanding of um, migration. <clears throat> The paper I'm giving today is inspired by the undergraduate courses I've taught during the current academic year at the University of Tulsa, courses that have pushed me to think beyond the geographical and disciplinary scope of my own research. I've spent this entire academic year teaching comparative literature courses on migration, and the, courses, the course I taught in the fall, Beyond the Nation State, Literature and Culture of Migration, used literature, historical narrative, essays, journalism, and both narrative and documentary film as vehicles for exploring questions of identity, integration, and acculturation in several countries around the world. In the course I'm teaching this semester, Women and Migration, literature provides a lens for examining the roles gender plays in migration, particularly in terms of how migration is experienced and narrated by women in literary works by diasporic women writers. Today, nearly half the world's migrants and refugees are women, yet most of the existing research and data that are collected on internal and international migrants are presented in generally in gender neutral terms, as if gender uh, didn't have an impact on the process of migration and acculturation. Amid this lacuna, literary studies can provide a vital insight into how, according to the women's historian Marilyn Jacoby Boxer, women know differently based on literary representations of women's lived experiences of migration. 
Throughout our literary, literary journey this semester, my students and I have borne witness to the stories of migrating women, paying particular attention to the representation of gendered identities, distinctions between gender roles in countries of origin and destination, the psychological effects of migration, such as loss of identity, marginalization, family separation, and trauma, to name a few and how questions of gender, race, and social class intersect and affect migration. Literature is a particularly useful tool for gaining insight into the subjective experience of individual migrants, while also reminding us of the overarching existential questions that all these narratives, and indeed most migrants, face. Even as many of my students have been closely following media coverage of contemporary debates surrounding immigration in the United States, for instance, the US-Mexico border wall, DACA, the travel bans, new census questions, etc., they have found that reading novels adds new layers of complexity and meaning to their interpretation of current events. So I feel fortunate to be participating in this symposium because it provides an ideal interdisciplinary forum to learn about and discuss some of the most pressing questions relating to migration that we are facing in the world today. So my paper, as Brian introduced, is called Trajectories of Dislocation, Genealogy, Drama and Circular Migration in Jean Reese's Wide Sargasso Sea and Marie Condé's Desirata. Jean Reese and Marie Condé are writers who belong to different generations, different literary generations. So Reese published um, her novels between 1927 and 1976, while Condé's first novel, Ere Macron Non, um, was published in 1976, so effectively the last year. Um, that um, Reese uh, published a novel. Um, and she continues to publish to this day, despite her rather advanced age. Um, as recently as 2017, she published the novel um, Le Fabuleux et Triste Destin d'Ivan et d'Ivana, which is the fabulous and sad destiny of Ivan and Ivana. However, as post-colonial writers, they have both rewritten canonical 19th century English novels and reframed them in a Caribbean context as a response to these master narratives. Most of the scholarly work <coughs> that compares Reese's and Condé's fiction, therefore pairs Reese's prequel of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre from 1847, Wide Sargasso Sea, with Condé's retelling of Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, which was also published in 1847, in her 1985 novel, La Migration des Coeurs, from, um, which, uh, so the English language title actually makes this relationship more obvious because it was translated as Windward Heights, right? So instead of Wuthering Heights, Windward Heights. <clears throat> I've decided to depart from this standard comparison of the two writers' work in order to focus on the impact of genealogy and trauma on migration in Reese's novel, Wide Sargasso Sea, and Condé's novel, Desirata, which was published in 1997 and also available in English translation. Unlike... <coughs> Unlike Wide Sargasso Sea and, Win uh, and Windward Heights, which are both set in the first half of the 19th century, Desirata takes place between 1960 and approximately 1990. Despite these distinct narrative time frames, both novels fema feature female protagonists who feel uprooted and adrift in the world as a result of complicated and deceptive family histories and the absence of maternal affection. <clears throat> In Wide Sargasso Sea, rumors of hereditary madness and incest swirl around Antoinette Causeway, a white creole in Jamaica. Antoinette's mother, Annette, withdraws her affection after her husband's death and seems to descend into madness after Antoinette's younger brother dies when the family's state is set ablaze by their former slaves turned servants. Both mother and daughter are subsequently moved to new locations, the mother to an undisclosed house in the countryside and Antoinette to a convent until her stepfather, 
an Englishman named Mr. Mason is able to arrange her marriage to another Englishman, basically the unnamed Mr. Rochester, who doesn't know about her tainted family background, which otherwise appears to be public knowledge throughout the island. Outside the convent on her first day living there, Antoinette is chased and taunted by children who say, look, the crazy girl, you crazy like your mother. She have eyes like a zombie and you have eyes like a zombie too. Intergenerational madness is also a theme of Condé's novel where people in the town of La Pointe on the island of Guadeloupe thought that Marie Noel, the light-skinned protagonist of Desirada, was, quote, a bit cracked, like her mother before her, quite simply cracked. Separated from their mothers, neither young woman can confirm whether these are merely malicious rumors or if her mother is truly mad. This lack of certainty also undermines Antoinette's and Marie Noel's sense of stability, causing both to be fearful of the future and of their own d possible descent into madness. <sighs> Both novels also highlight the impossibility of knowing the truth by providing the narrative perspectives of multiple characters whose versions of events contradict each other. In a climate of intense racial anxiety, the inability of knowing one's own history and to whom one is related serves as a major source of tension and lack of identity in both novels. <clears throat> The secret, unequal, and forceful sexual relations within the rigidly structured ethno-class system of these plantation societies, where the white plantation owner fathered multiple Ill illegitimate children with his slaves and then subsequently with his servants, further obscures the genealogies in the two novels. In Wide Sargasso Sea, rumors of Antoinette's relationship with Sandy, her half-brother, the illegitimate, illegitimate son of her father, Alexander Causeway, spread by a man who calls himself Daniel Causeway, who claims to be another bastard son of Antoinette's father, further taint the Causeway name with insinuations of incest. Indeed, Antoinette's own confused and fragmented memories of a goodbye kiss with Sandy seem to indicate that, they, that the two were romantically involved. In Desirada, Marie Noel's father's identity is a complete mystery and seems to be the product of sexual violence. Her 15-year-old mother, um, Re Reynalda, attempts to drown herself during her pregnancy, but she is saved by a woman named Ranelis, who ends up raising Marie Noel shortly after Reynalda abandons her infant in order to pursue her studies in France. Although Reynalda eventually sends for her daughter 10 years later to join her in France. She refuses to give her daughter uh, affection or to answer her questions about her father's identity. Without this knowledge of her origins, Marie Noël, quote, feels herself become a seaweed, towed by the whims of the current, which again, to me, seems to allude to Wide Sargasso Sea, um, because, uh, Marie Condé is a very well-read um, author. She's actually lived and taught at American University, so she would be familiar with this canon. Unable to claim her own identity and future, Marie Noël drifts from relationship to relationship with different men and eventually ends up marrying a Jamaican musician named Stanley and migrating to the United States, where the couple live in an impoverished immigrant suburb of Boston. After her husband's untimely death, Marie Noël becomes obsessed with finding out her father's identity and she returns to Guadeloupe and eventually to the small island of La Désirade in search of her much feared grandmother, who she hopes will unlock the secret of her father's identity. Some uh, ideas of the Caribbean. Uh, so, Daniel gave us a good uh, background, so I'm not going to repeat a lot of the things she said, but I'd like to start with uh, a quote, hoping that, hmm, okay, so let's see if, oh, okay, I think it's working, yes, let's, you know, today's going to be like the Caribbean, it's going to be chaotic, and uh, anything can happen. So, the quote, 
uh, from Edouard Glissant. Indies, I should put you into words, West Indies, to restore my dreams. Edouard Glissant and his poem, The Indies, by wondering if the descendants of displaced populations brought to the Americas my dream and create a better world to undo the first conqueror's misdoings. In 1996, and in 1966, Jean Rhys's Weissagas aussi echoes the same questioning. In a prequel to uh, Bronte's Jane Eyre, the Dominican Rhys imagines the life of Bertha Mason before her arrival in England. The novel depicts how the Jamaican-born white Creole Antoinette Causeway marries a British man only interested in her money in exchange for his good name. That is never named in the story. The narrative also depicts how Antoinette is displaced from one island to another, from one space to another, from a plantation to the convent, until she becomes the crazy uh, woman in the, let's see, this work, in the attic. Okay, here she is. <laughs> um, so contrasting intimate and public spaces, Reese uses a feminine lens to depict the colonial shock of bodies and cultures entering into contact and their struggle for dominion. I will use the marriage of Antoinette as this kind of metaphor. Rhys verse deploys for me a gendered poetics of belonging and displacement that brings to the fore the political implications of forced migration. This paper explores how Rhys brings attention to the interconnection between, not only between race and gender, but also ethnicity, class, and nationality in the construction of world history and how these interactions strengthen systems of oppression. The way in which Rhys positions forced migration in colonial history and the legibility of otherness in tension forces one to question how relationships to space and one's personal assumption feed mechanism of domination. So identity struggle and fight for reconnection are, are integral in Jean Rhys's White Saga Soci. So you could see a map of the Antilles, Great Antilles, Less Antilles, and she's going to move from Jamaica down to Dominica, the uh, Lesser Antilles. In that novel, a previous script prescribes Antoinette's future, Jane Eyre's story. The white Creole Antoinette's Cosway has to become Bertha. She has to become the mad woman in the attic. Each time she moves from one space to another, the Caribbean, from Jamaica to Dominica, uprooted from familiar surroundings until she crossed the ocean to be locked up in an attic in England, um, she loses a piece of herself, metamorphoses into Bertha, and becomes crazy. I will examine how Antoinette's marital relationship with a British man, a newcomer to the Caribbean, recreates the colonial encounter that dehumanizes her and transforms her like enslaved Africans before her into displaced individual. My paper would like to quickly remind, like Benitez Horo implied in one of his uh, study, that in the Caribbean, due to decolonization, uh, colonization, both white colonists and former enslaved Africans have been dehumanized. The question of belonging appears in this novel on the first page and entails or delineates a very gendered poetics. So Antoinette demonstrates how her identity and wiseness have been perpetually under assault due to her mother's origin and sex appeal. After 1833, uh, during the, after the emancipation, the Jamaican plutocracy was slowly replaced by a new wave of British settlers and challenged by former enslaved workers. And here this is what uh, Antoinette explains to her husband, and I quote, 
They say when trouble comes, close ranks, and so the white people did. However, we were not in their ranks. The Jamaican ladies had never approved of my mother because she pretty like pretty self, Christophin said. She was my father's second wife, far too young for him, they thought, and worse still, a Martinique girl. Critics have not attached enough importance to the fact that Antoinette's central mother, Annette, is from the French island of Martinique. They rather concentrate on a racial ambiguity. For me, the identity struggle in White Sargassosi is also about nationality and gender. Antoinette's relative of color explains to her husband in a letter, and I quote, Nobody would work for the young woman and her two children for French and English like cat and dog in this island since long time. For the Jamaican lady, meaning white Creole born in Jamaica, Annette is too pretty, too young for husband, meaning too French. We all know how the French people are. <laughs> Here, the suspicious, she's suspicious in Jamaica, which point to the stigma of lewdness and nymphomania. One of the gender stereotypes at play here is national, the alleged hypersexuality of French women in general and Caribbean women in particular. So, we all know Marie Antoinette, who was deemed a bad mother and also accused of the worst sexual perversion during the French Revolution. And, of course, Antoinette. There's a kind of connection here. And also, we have all know, or you should know, about Josephine Bonaparte's wife, who was known for her inability to be faithful to Bonaparte. And Josephine was born in Martinique. And she was a white Creole. So any people coming from these islands, like me, are dangerous. So, even when Annette remarries a wealthy white, a British man, Mr. Mason, a national origin, Martinique, France, and alleged lasciviousness both plague her and her daughter and transform them into victimized outcasts of society. They do not belong. Okay, so. These pictures are images of a movie uh, from, I think, 1996. Uh, so you could see all this kind of erotic undertone. And I put Martinique here, and you have a little uh, statue or bust of Josephine uh, de Beauharnais. Purity of national origin and sexual behavior matter to be an upstanding member of a British ruling class. Suspecting that is a cuckold, Antoinette's husband sees her, and I quote, as the infamous daughter of an infamous mother. Hypersexuality is not simply a sign of potential blackness or miscegenation, uh, like some critics have argued, but for me, it's a sign of Frenchness, another type of otherness which is non British. And we know that British and French people, they don't go along. Um, now better, but upon the time, no. So Antoinette's fashion sense and sensuality demonstrate also a strong link uh, to her mother's French island and culture. For instance, she expresses her allegiance to a sophisticated and vibrant Martinique through fashion and the dresses she will wear. Obviously, for the pure tinatical Jamaican ladies, and English women, such French vibrancy is inappropriate. Hence the or their insinuation that pretty Annette is too sexually wild for her older husband, and if he is unable to satisfy her, a fiery black man will. The black man in Reese's work is not a potential rapist, but a seductive figure a temptation difficult to resist as a half-brother. Why Sargasso C manipulates the usual colonial trope of the hypersexualized black man. However, race, rape, or uh, sexual coercion is also at play in the story. And then Reese exposes, knowingly or unknowingly, I'm not really sure, the true 
rapists in an historical uh, setting, meaning the white man of a British man, during their honeymoon on a mother estate on one of the uh, Windward Islands, namely Dominica, to spite his wife and to lord power over her, her husband has a sexual encounter with Amélie, which is the spitting image of uh, Antoinette, in the room next to the marital bedroom. That's why I put two rooms here, uh, to give you an idea. Um, then, his behavior allows her to be further displaced from her home. How could she be in control of a space when her husband had just had a relationship uh, with a servant next to a bedroom? How could she be in control of her own private space and life? And then she turns, she reproaches her husband his affair with a mixed race Amelie, and she explained to him, and I quote, you like brown girls better, don't you? You abuse the planters and made up stories about them, but you do the same thing, end of quote. Here the implied topos of sexual coercion or sexual misbehavior uh, is finally associated between old colonists and new colonizers. In contradicting her husband's narrative, Antoinette breaks down certain racial and gendered uh, misconception. So more pictures. In Reese's novel, narrative level allows the reader to perceive how characters and narrators are often masters of deceptions. This novel is about everyone lying. We don't know, uh, and particularly Antoinette. Um, as a first narrator, she reconstructs her experience as a legitimate white creole at a time where white creoles becomes irrelevant. And in so doing, she's trying to show how her husband's own narration during the half part of the book is the one telling the story, and her voice slowly disappears. His voice becomes the nexus of all the voices against her. In the game she plays, Antoinette attempts to convey to her husband how people who manipulate her identity and misname her have victimized this white creole. So, I'm warning you, there's some profanities coming, but it's in the novel. It's not me. But I will gladly read that. Uh, a white cockroach, that's me. That's why they call all of us who were here before their own people in Africa sold them to the slave traders. And I've heard English women call us white niggers. So between you, I often wonder who am I and where is my country and where do I belong and why was I ever born at all? Antoinette here makes a historical commentary and underscores how drastically things have changed. The glorious Creole community a family knew has disappeared. Here she does not question colonialism per se. However, a narrative underscores the historicity and fleetingness of racial and gender categories in colonial discourse. She lives in the wake of the 1833 emancipation in Jamaica, in a society that has ruined most planters, and she belongs to a fallen elite. She's not a slave. Pejorative expressions such as white cockroach and white nigger translate a new historical sensibility that emerges after the collapse of the plantation world. If you're poor and you're white, you're a white nigger. This insult brings forth not racial mixing, but loss, the loss of economic power and social standing. As Tia, Antoinette's former black playmate, explains during a violent outburst, and I quote, it's further down here, but you will, I will still uh, read for you, plenty white people in Jamaica, real white people, they got gold money. All time white people, nothing but white nigger. She has stealing of Antoinette's dress to punish and spite her signals how black people at the time have a desire to assume the place of white Creoles. 
Tia's gesture also foreshadows as well two mixed race characters' behavior, Amelie and Daniel, both connected by blood to illegitimate, uh, illegitimate children connected by Antoinette by blood, and they both plot to get rid of her. Thus, Antoinette's antagonism and racism toward people of color who no longer respect her as a true mistress reveal how she's dispossessed of a privileged status in a changing world despite a color of a color of her skin. The type of displacement Antoinette faces is also mental and psychological. Here, displacement is not simply a Freudian, and I quote, unconscious defense mechanism whereby the mind substitutes either a new aim or a new object for goals felt in their original form to be dangerous, end of quote. This type of displacement is an estrangement, alienation, that separates her from herself and others. For instance, she's aware of the danger of losing a previous name, and she tells her husband, Bertha is not my name. You are trying to make me into someone else, calling me by another name. I know that's Obea too. Bertha is a new name that traps Antoinette symbolically. Looking at the politics of belonging and displacement in the novel help the reader see the danger of his renaming, like in the Caribbean, when the colonizer will arrive and rename places and eventually also people. The topos of renaming is political and signal how the workings of imperialism and patriarchy influence, mold, and alters personal and intimate identity. Antoinette Conway goes from a French name to a British name, Bertha Mason. In refusing to name her husband, because we, never, we know he's Rochester, but she never calls him, we never hear his name, Antoinette seems to display some type of agency. A counter-narrative helps her stress how her husband attempts to create his own reality while destroy, destroying hers. Eventually, at the end of the novel, Antoine's husband recognizes the foolishness of his project of domination, is no master. After recalling nightmares, he acknowledges, and I quote, I was certain that everything I had imagined to be the truth was false, false. Only magic and the dream are true. All the rest is lie. The notion of dreaming here brings us back to the quote uh, by uh, Edouard Glissant. In that poem, the colonizer smugly proclaims, and I read again, in this, I shall put you into words, West in this to restore my dream. Dreaming the new world, the colonizer intended to make this space is. And in doing so, he could pretend that his word was the word of God, the vector of creation. But Antoinette and her husband are unable to create the Caribbean or to dominate this space. Antoinette's husband eventually flees the Caribbean, dragging her with him. In England, Antoinette's own dream recalls how she has attempted in vain to redefine a world in which she becomes irrelevant. Here we go. Before throwing herself out of a window to her death, Antoinette set her husband's mansion to on fire. The blaze will blind him, resulting in his inability to use his colonial and patriarchal gaze. In fact, Antoinette ends their masquerade, their marriage, while she reaffirms her eligibility eligibility, I can even read that, eligibility, and reveals her husband for who he was from the start, a man unable to see. One, when one studies the poetics of belonging and displacement in Weissaga Soci, one faces the eligibility of otherness and realizes that colonial discourse compulsively creates false stories. 
Antoine's ordeal shows how a body stands as a contact zone, site of conflicts between conflicted ideologies. Illustrating how, illustrating how the legacies of colonialism plays out even in the most intimate spaces. Thank you. Do you have slides? Yeah, I, I have no visual aids, but I will just okay, that's good. present here. Yeah. Hold a second. So uh, our last speaker is, um, for this panel is uh, Sung Ho Lee, PhD candidate uh, at the University of Tulsa, Department of English, and he's going to be speaking on Reading Jean Rich's Smile, Please, Female Body, Autobiography, and Home. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Sung Ho Lee. I'm from South Korea. I'm a second year PhD student in English department at the University of Tulsa, and I'm a student research fellow in Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma Center for the Humanities this year. That's how I am having this chance to present my idea. So thank you for the OCH and Gilchrist to give me this opportunity. And uh, today I, I'd like to talk about Jinri's autobiography, Smile Please. This is her last work, published in 1979. Uh, so we, the birth date of Jinri's is not quite accurate, but we assume that she was born in uh, 1890, so it was published when she was almost about 90, but she died at, in the process of final revision. So uh, the, the editor compiled all the um, papers and then published it, naming it Smile Please, an, an unfinished autobiography. So I'd like to talk about this autobiography and see how it articulates her complex identities. So like James Joyce, James Joyce is a portrait of the artist as a young man. Jinri's autobiography, Smile Please, an unfinished autobiography, ends with the diary entry, the diary written by herself during the 1940s. Unlike Joyce's, however, this entry contains what can be called a dramatic monologue. In the two entries named The Trial of Jinris and Trial Continued, she textually performs the role of the judge and the judge. While the judge represents the normative conception of gender, nationality, and race, the judge represents the writer herself trying to get out of these forces. Although these dramatic monologues can point to a variety of themes of Rhys writings, one of those would be Rhys' understanding of performance. Working as a chorus girl, dreaming of becoming an actress as a teenager in England, and growing up in Dominica, where carnival is one of the defining features for people's understanding of life and identity, she appears to have pretty profound understanding of operation of cultural performance. In Smile Police, she, she recalls watching the carnival in Dominica, quote, the three days before Lent were carnival in Roseau. Roseau is the capital city of Dominica. And we couldn't dress up or join, but we could watch from the open window. There were gaily masked crowds with a band listening I, I'd think that I'd give anything, anything to be able to dance like that. Uh, this course shows not only the cultural milieu in which she grew up, but also the racial tension which makes her unable to join in the carnival, the cultural product of which she can be only a spectator. Ironically, when she tries to be an actress in England, her attempt becomes frustrated due to her strong West Indian accent, according to one biography about her. So Rhys is ostracized in one place because she looks white, and in the other because she sounds black. And both Dominica and England do not accept a Creole girl, a displaced hybrid, somewhat undefinable and therefore dangerous subject. And these happenings might have made her acknowledge the significance of how she should perform herself. Interestingly, in her autobiography, Rhys does not say anything about her accent. 
Instead, the reason she explains for having to leave the Academy of Dramatic Art in England is her father's sudden death and the ensuing economic hardship. The dis this discrepancy between the biography about her written by somebody else and her own autobiography elucidates the extent to which that an autobiographical narrative is not necessarily a faithful reflection of one's life. Rather, it can be a performative practice that an author-actor self-consciously designs and directs to create major defects. Traditionally, an autobiography has been deemed as sort of mirror that reflects one's life, thus lacking profundity or complexity that fictional works have. As Smith and Watson observe in, in a book called Women, Autobiography, and Theory, autobiography, specifically women's autobiography, is seldom taken seriously uh, so this is a quote, seldom taken seriously as a focus of study before the 70s, since it was not deemed appropriately complex for academic dissertations, criticism, or the literary canon. Consequently, even writers, writers like Rees, whose fictions are reputed for being quasi-autobiographical, hardly draw any attention for their life writings. Smile Police has thus far attracted only a handful of scholarly attentions since its, since its publication in 1979, while Why Sagasusi is widely read, taught, and written about across the globe. While Erica Johnson, who is one of those handful of scholars, suggests that its incompleteness as an unfinished autobiography may account for this lack of attention, but I would like to suggest that it is the genre, or more precisely the social and cultural assumption about the genre of autobiography that blocks both lay readers and acad academics to devote their time and effort to this work. Even in the foreword written by Diana Ethel to Smile Please, there is that assumption about autobiography since it says that Rhys, quote, wanted to get the facts down because she was sometimes angered and hurt by what other people wrote about her. And here, getting the facts down can be somewhat misleading because it prompts the reader to look at this text as a collection of historical facts of Rhys' Rhys lived experience. However, what Rhys' autobiography actually reveals is a significant degree of performativity, making this text a carefully and cunningly designed cultural artifact with, with all her literary devices. So here in this paper, I'd like to suggest that Smile Police is a work that Rhys' technique of cultural and ideological performance culminates in as a literary career arrives because it's the less work and to examine how this performative autobiographical narrative shed a light to the relationships among female body displays, displacement and subjectivity in an interesting way. Uh, to analyze this text in this line of thought, let me go back to the chapter where she is silent about her accent. This is the chapter where she describes her first arrival in England at the age of 17, and earlier of which she depicts her first, uh, her experience of going to the zoo for the first time in England, in London. And there is a lengthy quote here. So as for the zoo, I simply hated it. This is Jinri's voice. We saw the lions first, and I thought the majestic lion looked at me with such sad eyes. Then we made a special journey to see the Dominica parrot. The gray bird was hunched in on, on himself, the most sully, resentful parrot I'd ever seen. Finally, we went to, the, went to see the hummingbirds. The hummingbirds finished me. The birds were flying around in a bewildered way, trying, to, trying desperately to get out, it seemed to me. Even their colors were dim. I got such an impression of hopeless misery that I couldn't bear to look at them. So what I would like to look at, at this, in this quote is a strong sense of identification between the narrator and the narrated, namely Rhys and the animals here. The identification evokes a sense of being displaced and misplaced since the animals as well as Rhys 
become disoriented and dispirited in this strange place. Specifically, both the birds, one of which the Dominican parrot comes from Dominica, just like Rhys herself, symbolize the predicament and the entrapment in which Rhys is being situated to. So without telling the fact that she is marginalized due to her West Indian identity, she efficiently evokes a feeling of what it means to be a displaced migrant. She even goes beyond it by creating a sort of um, migrant community here that encompasses not only human but also animals who, that are displaced at this very heart of empire. Um, interestingly, what, this, what makes this map of network more enlarged is its underlying inner textuality. So thankfully, we already know about why Sagasusi, so I can uh, explain it. So readers of Jin Rhys can be reminded by this London zoo scene, especially by the Dominican parrot, of why the Sagasusi, where uh, a green parrot named Coco that dies at the attempt to escape the, the house, which was caught fire by the uh, black Dominican um, native people after the emancipation. That parrot is identified with Antoinette, who shares the same fate when she uh, catches the fire at Rochester's house. So, this ident identification of Coco and Antoinette is repeated and replayed in this autobiography by that of the parrot and autobiographical self of Jin Rhys. Um, so, these two different webs of autobiography and fictional works are interweaved. In this sense, Rhys is like the Dominican parrot, and that parrot is like Coco, the parrot in Y Sagasusi, and that parrot is like Antoinette in Y Sagasusi. So it breaks down the boundary between human and animal, and also fiction and real, to the extent that what exists is rather inner subjectivity than an individual authentic self that has long been considered as the foundation of autobiography. And also this breakdown brings about a cannibalistic sphere where becoming a different thing is possible. From the very beginning, Jinri's smile please poses an interesting notion of self, subjectivity, body, and performativity. It, uh, this autobiography does not begin with dry facts about the birth of an, about the birth of an author. Instead, it starts with the staging of one of the moments from her childhood when she was taken a family photo. And I have a quote here. So this is the very first sentences from the autobiography. Smile, please, the man said, not quite so serious. I looked down, so this is generous. I looked down at my white dress, the one that I got for my birthday, and my legs, and the white socks coming halfway up my legs, and the black shiny shoes with the strap over the instep. Now, the man said, keep still, my mother said. I tried, but my arm shot up on his own accord. Oh, what a pity, she moved. We, <laughs> you must keep still, my mother said, frowning. So we can just read this scene as, the, as what happened to Rhys' life, but also my interpretation is that this scene is showing a power struggle around the female body. Here, Rhys' Reese, own body is required to perform a certain role as a female, as a daughter, as a part of family in this culturally specific context of family photo. The imperative sentence of smile please is the very first word readers encounter, setting the overall tone of the text. Rhys autobiographical self is continually forced to conform to the socially established role play, as in this scene where she has to perform a good docile daughter. And smiling is a visible sign of the performance that does not express something from inside, but itself is a very constituent of identity. It's not 
being a good daughter makes you smi- makes her smile, but smiling makes her a good daughter. So ident- in this sense, identity is not about what who you really are, but it's not about how you look, what you do, and or how you perform yourself. Uh, but the very but the failure of Reese to smile suggests that it is through this failure she can resist this authoritative power. So this unruly body that seems to move autonomously or unex- unexpectedly like Ram that shot up of, of its own accord, um, this disrupts and destroys this scene, exposing the ruptures in the assumption about gender identity. But Rist's autobiographical writing goes beyond that, goes further than merely portraying her subversive failure. It is her attempt to appropriate the very same authoritative voice and to make her own, to make it her own. The titling of her autobiography as Smile Please, the words uttered by the oppressive dominant figures like the cameraman or her mother, is itself a strategy. If the Smile Please uttered by the cameraman and her mother represents a social constraint, then Riz ventril- ventriloquizing it, or her voicing it through her own body, creates a possibility of different in- interpretation. In this sense, Riz's smile police can be read as her own desperate, triumphant effort to make herself smile and happy, despite all the other smile pleases from other people. Mm, and maybe another thing we can notice in this opening scene is the color contrast of the wrist outfit, the comparison of black and white between bla- black shiny shoes and her white dress and white socks. With such a simple image as this, wrist effectively invokes the, her identity crisis, the crisis of a hybrid subject like a creole being situated somewhere between Caribbean and Europe, and between black and white, and always feel, feeling displaced. And this sense of split self, or multiple selves in oneself, is more stressed upon right after the family photo scene, when Rhys looks at that, that very same photograph three, three years afterwards. And there is another quote. Uh, it was about three years afterwards that one early morning, dressed for school, I came downstairs before anyone else and, and for some reason looked at the photograph attentively, realizing with dismay that I wasn't like it any longer. I remember the dress she was wearing, so much prettier than anything I had now. The eyes were a stranger's eyes. Catching sight of myself in the long looking glass, I felt despair. I hated myself. As in the dramatic monologue of the diary entry, she stages her two different selves here, her younger self in the photograph and her present self looking at it. And Rhys' autobiographical self looking at the photo begins to call the self in the photo with a third person pronoun, her, so distancing these two different selves. Through her own peculiar strategy of st- staging multiple selves in one scene that she is, and sh- in some sense she is not, she can not only perform different subjectivities imposed on her, but also reveal the identity crisis she is going through as a hybrid and hyphenated subject. Considering the identification and inner textual connection that we discussed earlier, we can draw a larger network of inner subjective selves, so like the bird, the animal, and her autobiographical self, and the self in the photo. So all these are genres, but some, somewhat they are not. And all of, all of these images are mirroring a subject or an object, kind of both, whose name is Jinris, all but partially. So the created effect of all these different identities 
um, the created effect of showing all these different identities is a sort of cubist portrait of an autobiographical artist, a portrait that is always incomplete and unfinished. For Reese, there is not a finished or complete autobiography that can fully encompass oneself. Autobiographical text, specifically a post-colonial and female autobiographical text, is necessarily an unfinished form, constantly working in a way that autobiographical self performs and negotiates its, its multiple and often disparate subjectivities. But then this contested textual space of autobiography enables Rees to yoke these otherwise unyokable personas and to identify the unidentifiable. This is the way she can come to terms with herself and situate herself. Unlike the Caribbean carnival or the English, English theater where one can perform a different persona insofar as she is conformed to a certain social construct like being either exclusively black or white. A textual stage here serves as the only space where she can be at home, even though there is a still sense of unhomeliness, and where she can perform as heterogeneous subjectivities as she is, remaining an excess or a residue of the social system, remaining as somebody who looks white and sounds black. Thank you. So we have a few moments for some questions and comments of our panelists, uh, if you have some. And um, um, so I turn the conversation over to our audience. Go ahead, Sean. Let me ask you a question about uh, uh, accents. So I mean, I, I was stuck in your paper somehow when you said that. The, doesn't allude to the accent, but this clearly plays part of this sort of second stage of Jimmy Reese's life, which becomes first England and then Paris, and that's where sort of all of these famous French, you know, sort of modernist novels for Reese have written. Uh, and, uh, and the use of accent in the in White Sargasso Sea, it just strikes me as, as you guys are thinking about migration and movement, language is one of these things, especially accents are one of these things, it's, it's just not, I mean, it's an integral part of the identity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's, but it's not a part that can be performed, uh, sort of taken on and, and, and put off in a way so that other people can. So I just, I wonder if you could each talk in your different papers about how Reese herself is using the novel form and, and using accents within the language, within the novel form, to think about uh, how language plays its role in shaping itself and what its, what its limits are, as she imagined, that, that, that it's these sort of transient things at this place. <laughs> Do you want to go first, or? Can you go first? Oh, you're such a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I think you're right. Language is integral part of this novel, because if a mother is from Martinique, she's going to have a French accent and a French Creole accent, even if she speaks English. So she's not even going to have like a French accent from France. So, you know, you could hear me, you, you could see that, you know, I've got different, my accent is weird, it does change with the weather. Um, <laughs> So there are things you could change about yourself, except if you're like my brother with a kind of mimic, he will just mimic any kind of accent and you will not know where to place him. The minute I open my mouth, someone will know exactly where are you from. So, and then the question, I can see the question in their eyes before they ask the question there. So in, in the book really, um, when you think about the notion of a body and a body moving spaces, then also the way she's gonna speak, Though she doesn't say that in the novel itself, but when you're very, are you paying attention to accents, you know that this is how also she's marginalized. Because the way she speaks or the way she thinks, because the language is not simply the way you word things, it's also the way you view the world. Uh, so that's why this novel, at least West Sargasso see, uh, you know, and I had the picture at the beginning where you could see like the, those movements of algae all over the, the place, is a mixture of so many different things. There are so many different layers in that particular novel. You have gender, you have race, but you also have linguistic problems, because at times, you do have French Creole uh, in the novel. So sometimes they call each other cher, which means my dear in, in French Creole. 
share. So, so, it's, so first time I read this novel, I was like, oh, they're speaking Creole. They're not speaking, uh, they're speaking French Creole. They're not speaking Haitian Creole. They're speaking the Creole from Dominica, which is really close to the Martinican Creole. So already you see there's a kind of subculture there. Um, and I think she carries all of that with her when she goes to England. It's already in White Sargassosi, and you know, and, and, and there's no doubt that it's also in a biography. So you're right; it's a different angle uh, to study uh, the complexity of, of the Caribbean, but also transatlantic movements. Because when you move, you you, you will never. You, I mean, except if you're good, you cannot really lose uh, your accent. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. I, I don't know how to answer your question, but I, I just found it really inter interesting that she is not, she's silent about her accent when she's explaining why she had to leave the academy. And then I guess one of the reasons why she's silent is that, um, I don't know, instead of talking about her disadvantages in the society, it is more empowering to kind of create a community of displaced subjects. And that's why, I, I guess, that's why she brought this Zeus in, in her autobiography, cre creating a very interesting sort of, you know, network between human and animal, like, like in Wai Sagarsusi. So Wai Sagarsusi, uh, Coco is strongly identified, the parody is strongly identified with the heroine, and yeah, so, yeah, I think, so, uh, Risa is using this kind of same strategy in autobiography as she does in a fictional work. So, yeah, is that answering?